and welcome to Making and Mixing Massive Music. This is a new series of videos designed to help you produce tracks that sound larger than life, like they were recorded and performed in an arena. Uh, that's most commonly associated with rock music, so if that's your chosen field, there should be a lot of interest to you here. Just a quick disclaimer, I have been mixing and producing rock music for many years, but I am far from an expert. So if you'd like to correct me on anything or leave some constructive feedback, then please do so underneath this video. Another thing to add is when it comes to mixing music, there are no rules, so do it however you want. And if it sounds good to you, then that's absolutely fine. But there are certain things that are accepted to be a good idea and accepted to work. So we'll look at some of those here and it's really down to you if you would like to take those on board. Okay, in this first, uh, in this first tutorial, we're gonna look at song arrangement uh, because there's a lot you can do uh, in the songwriting stage to contribute to that massive stadium sound. So we'll take a look at uh, some of the techniques you could consider all the way back before you even hit record. Here we go. Now, one of the keys to getting a massive sound is to spend some time during the songwriting stage thinking small. This is because if you want your listener to perceive your track as massive, you also need them to, to show them what small is. This gives them a sense of scale and also makes the song a bit more interesting to listen to because it has some rise and fall throughout. If you imagine starting a track full on with all guns blazing, volume turned up to 11, and this carried on through the verses, the choruses, the middle, and ended that way as well, by the end the listener would have lost any sense of hugeness from your track because with everything sounding massive, in the end nothing actually does. So we need to spend some time shrinking down parts of the song, this could be the intro, the verse, or, or whatever you want really, to give the listener something to measure against. Now, there's various ways uh, that this can be done. These are only suggestions, but uh, just to give you some examples. We could actually start the track small, so that when the big bits arrive, they sound super big compared to the tiny intro. Here's an example of that. Now we can also drop out instruments in various sections of the track. This will make certain parts of the song sound smaller. In this example, everything bar the drums and vocals are present in the verse. So when the guitars arrive again a bit further down the line, they sound super big. Let's take a listen. So those uh, big wall of guitars do sound extra large compared to the, um, the uh, thin arrangements of the verse there. Now also you can make areas of the song sound that bit nicer as well. So in this example we've cleaned the guitars and used a clean tone just to take that bit of energy out in the verse. Here we go. So we've got some clean guitars there contrasting nicely with the uh, the raw electric guitars when they come back in. Another trick uh, that's often used is to actually sing lower in areas of the track. Uh, this takes uh, a bit of energy out, out of the song, uh, but also uh, helps create that element of smallness, uh, which uh, puts the big parts in good stead when they arrive a bit further down the line. Let's take a listen. Holding on to blind faith. Now one further idea, I say just a suggestion, is you can also play areas of the track at half time. Again this just drops the energy levels down slightly which makes the bigger parts even bigger to the listener. Here we go.
Now, in addition to uh, arranging the song, there are also some production techniques which we'll discuss in future videos that can also help you shrink down areas of the track. Examples being uh, vocals that sound like they're recorded down a telephone, always works well. And also panning instruments nearer to the centre uh, when compared to the huge sections which are panned quite far to the left and right. That will also help the sections sound quite tiny in comparison. Now, after spending some time making parts of your track sound small, there will come a time when it's time to get big. Now, there are various production techniques that will help to create a massive sound, but here, let's look at how the song arrangement itself can all work towards creating that stadium sound. The first technique has been around for many, many years. Um, it involves thickening instruments by double tracking them. Now, double tracking gives a denser sound. Uh, this commonly applies to guitars and vocals and involves recording the same part two or more times. The majority of rock tracks have more than one guitar playing and then these tracks are then panned left and right so they span the whole stereo field. Now this works especially well because the two takes won't be exactly the same and these minor imperfections, these small differences, result in a more dense sound and this becomes very important when we look at the stereo field. The important thing to note is the music sounds at its largest and at its widest when there are differences to the left and right side of the stereo field. Some instruments are exempt. I wouldn't suggest panning bass guitar unless you're seriously crazy. And also lead vocals aren't often panned unless it's for effect. But we do need to create a change in what happens on the left side to what happens on the right side to give the biggest and widest stereo sound. This is very important and we're going to keep coming back to this as this tutorial progresses. Let's take a look now at how we would uh, thicken instruments by double tracking. OK, so we've talked briefly about double tracking parts. Uh, let's have a look at what that actually is. OK, so uh, no mocking my guitar playing. That's the first rule. But um, the idea behind, behind double tracking is you have your guitar part and you go ahead and record it. So it might sound like this. <laughs> OK, to double track that, you press stop, rewind, use a different track and record the same part again. You then have two tracks which you can pan left and right. Uh, and the reason this works so well is because the two tracks are subtly different because of human imperfections in the playing. It's just a fact of life. But those differences force the, uh, the left and the right side of the mix to sound slightly different and therefore wider and bigger and more massive. But we can push that even further because if you take your double track part, you can actually play it slightly differently to force the differences to be even greater. For example, you record your first part. <laughs> And then you can record the same part, but playing the chords in a different configuration. So it's the same piece of music, just played slightly differently to force the differences even more. So it could be like this. Okay, like I said, no mocking the guitar playing. This isn't a the guitar instructional video, uh, but you could take that one step further still and record it like this. Now when you have all these parts you'll then uh, pan them across the stereo field and because they are, are different the left side and the right side of the mix will sound different and therefore sound wider and bigger just by taking a look at the arrangement. You can also apply this to vocals. When you get to a massive section in your song, usually the chorus, you generally want to record more than just one vocal line, generally speaking. So why not record that as a harmony rather than singing in unison with the lead vocal part? Because then that, again, forces the differences in the two parts and they will sound bigger and thicker. 
A band that exploits that in terms of vocals are, are Nickelback, where they record a harmony throughout the majority of their songs from start to finish. And that does give a, a thicker, bigger, larger vocal sound for them. Okay, we're now going to look at how we can apply that to a keyboard. All right. Okay, when it comes to a recording a keyboard part, uh, the philosophy is exactly the same. You're looking to double track parts, make them subtly different, so the overall sound when it's panned sounds different on the left to the right, that will make the stereo sound sound wider and more massive. So you might have just a simple chord progression. You'd then double track that, uh, but I recommend playing it in a slightly different configuration to force the differences. Then when you have these takes together, you can pan them left and right, and as I've said, differences between the, uh, the parts will make them sound wider and larger. Okay, but you can force this even further one or experiment with uh, a different tone altogether for the uh, double track parts. When the, all the various parts are brought together and panned, the differences, uh, as we keep going back to, will make uh, the left different to the right, making the overall sound larger. Try it. So now we've seen how to create double tracks, let's listen to that in action. We're going to hear a chorus now that has guitars playing subtly different uh, chord configurations, keyboards with the same, different configurations, and harmony layered vocals. And this is how it would come together to create that big sound. Now, earlier in this tutorial, we did discuss making parts of the track sound small by singing low. Now, the opposite can also work. If you want to really go for it in the chorus and really lift the energy, then try singing super high. Here we go. As you can hear there, the high vocals do add in that bit of extra energy just to give a lift in the choruses. Now, another technique to consider is um, want to add in some extra instruments in the chorus. Not too many, but just bring something in to make the chorus that bit bigger to other sections of the track. In this example now, we're going to hear some organ joining in the arrangement in the chorus just to give it that extra lift. But just a word of caution when adding extra instruments in, uh, you can actually try and go too big, which we're going to look at now. When you are making your big sections of your song sound huge, it is still important to retain a sense of scale. I wouldn't suggest double tracking every single instrument because if every instrument sounds big and thick and dense, then again, none really do in the end. There is also a tipping point where you can actually double track too much. So if you're recording upwards of four or five or six guitar parts, then you will get an accumulation of human error between the takes and it goes from sounding big and dense into just sounding plain sloppy. So you need to kind of experiment to see what works for you in that respect. 
Now, another caution is that some instruments don't like being double tracked. And one very key example is the bass. Uh, if you were to double track that, this would make the low end sound quite confused and cluttered and your track will lose power. Um, the bass really needs to be clear and defined. So again, I would recommend just having one bass part at work at any given time. Now, one important rule when arriving at that huge sound is the power of three. Now this rule discusses uh, the fact that you shouldn't have too many different parts playing at once. Uh, it is very tempting with today's technology where you have almost infinite tracks to record all manner of different parts. You could have a ukulele in the chorus, pianos coming in, keyboards, strings, midi strings, different guitar parts, and throw them all in the mix together thinking it will result in a massive sound. It in fact doesn't. I used to believe it did and that's why my early mixes are all very very cluttered. And that is until I discovered the power of three. The listener will only be able to concentrate on three parts at any one time, okay, as you can see here. The other parts at work will only be there to support, or they may even be clutter, that the track would sound better if they were cut out altogether. So for any given point in the track, you need to decide which three things you want your listener to pay attention to. Then take a look at the rest of the instruments playing at that time, and decide if any are getting in the way. If so, cut them out. If they're there to support, make sure that that's where they sit in the mix. Okay, this will result in a more cohesive sound and it will sound tight and will sound more powerful to the listener. So, in summary, taking stuff out can lead to a more powerful sound. Now here's an example. What we're about to hear now is a piece of a track where in the verses there's lovely synths at work wishy-washying around in the mix but by the time the rhythm guitars come back in I want all the listeners attention on my supreme rhythm guitar playing that's why the synths stop so that there's nothing detracting from the focus of those guitars here we go Now, if I'd have left those synths carrying on through the guitar riff, uh, then the guitars themselves wouldn't have sounded as powerful because the listener's attention is split and they're not sure, well, is it the keys that are important? Is the guitars are important? By cutting them out, I'm making the statement, I want you to hear these guitars because they're awesome. <clears throat> I would recommend experimenting with uh, taking instruments out of your arrangement to get a more powerful sound. It can be scary at first, but you will soon learn how to turn it to your advantage. As we get towards the close of this tutorial, I would just like, like to uh, put forward the idea of actually creating a demo for your songs before actually trying to commit them to tape good and proper. Now, most home studios come with some kind of drum machine and for all of my songs I did create a demo version. Here's one example. Now that track there, the, all of the drums are being supplied by Easy Drummer, but you can use any drum program at your, at your fingertips really. The idea being that you can create a track uh, at a fixed tempo, which you can then use to create a click track for your drummer to record against. For example, this is how the click track went on to sound. Now by getting a drummer to record against that click track, the finished song will be tighter because the tempo will be consistent all the way through. And also by recording a click track in that way, the drummer can record in isolation. You don't need the rest of the band to play behind him. So there'll be less spill down the microphones again, which will contribute to a, a better, more focused and uncluttered sound in the end. Another advantage to creating a demo is you can experiment with arrangements. Okay, so you have your uh, demo version here. 
uh, you could uh, experiment with hacking sections out. You could take out the whole verse if you wanted to. Let's get rid of that there. You could decide you don't want the verse there. You can move, go straight to the chorus. You can move bits around here, there, everywhere. You can basically play with the whole arrangement of the song before trying to commit it to tape good and proper. It's far easier to play with a demo version than it is trying to uh, edit around with uh, proper drum tracks and so on. So that's one reason for doing a demo version. Now also, you might stumble across recording a moment of genius on your demo version. If you can imagine recording a demo, you'll be recording it under far less pressure than recording the finished take. Now because of this, you could easily stumble across a superb performance just by accident. And if you do this, there's no reason why you can't then keep that and insert it into the finished song. Now even further than that, uh, this particular song we're listening to now, I recorded my demo vocals, so here they are just quickly. Now when I came to actually record the finished song, I put myself under so much pressure recording the vocals that I couldn't give a good performance at all. So in the end, I used the whole demo take. Here we go. So the demo version can bail you out in these situations. Uh, but as I say, I have also worked with guitar players who put in some outstanding performances when they're not under pressure. And then as soon as you say, this is the finished version, go, uh, it doesn't go quite as well. So demos can be a good place to capture moments of genius. All right, so that's the end of this tutorial. I hope it has been useful. Uh, if so, please do share my video. Now, next time we're going to start looking at uh, recording and editing the instruments themselves. So I shall see you next time. Thank you.